The radical left continues to search for a crime and wreck lives, and break laws, and violate every principle of justice, fairness, and liberty. You see it. You see it on a constant basis. It's really called prosecutorial misconduct. You didn't pay tax on the car or a company apartment or education for your grandchildren. I don't even know. Do you have to? But does anybody know the answer to that stuff? Former President Trump sounding off last night after prosecutors in New York indicted the Trump Organization and its CFO on tax fraud charges. Here to discuss that and much more, Time National Political Correspondent Molly Ball, ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, Washington Post National Correspondent Mary Jordan, and ABC News contributor LZ Granderson, host of ABC's Life Out Loud podcast. Great to see all of you on this 4th of July, and thanks for coming in. And Avery, I want to start with Donald Trump. The case against the Trump Organization and its CFO, President Trump, was not himself charged, but this is his namesake country, uh, company. How big of a deal is this? Well, listen, the, the investigation is ongoing in the New York State's Attorney General's office and the Manhattan DA's office. And so if there's any evidence that, surface, that surfaces that implicates the president, he could be in legal jeopardy. And look, Adam, Alan Weisselberg is facing 15 felonies. And so we don't know what he's going to do. We know that he spo- uh, that the former president spoke with John Santucci, or John Santucci earlier this week, and he said he didn't believe that Weisselberg would flip on him. But listen, time will tell. And, and Molly, the former president has, you heard, blasted the charges as partisan, no surprise there. But do you think he's at all worried? I was also fascinated by what he said there. It's almost as if he admitted that all really happened, that they didn't pay taxes. Well, and you see him trying to run the same playbook that he did for the scandals that beset him during his administration, right? Portray it as a partisan witch hunt, and then basically... Uh, in, in a way, admit to things while uh, while claiming that they're all okay, they're all normal, these are all regular ways of doing business, that anyone would be perplexed by the kinds of things being charged by the prosecutors. The question is, does that hit the same when you're not president anymore? When you're just a guy throwing a rally and you don't even have a Twitter account, does it have the same resonance? Does it affect the, the course of events? And I think what he's going to find is the prosecutors in New York are, are relatively immune to that kind of pressure. And so the question will be, uh, you know, does it does that have any effect or does, is he going to have to mount some more formal defense and, and mary what's also notable in this is what wasn't in the indictment nothing on the alleged hush money paid to stormy daniels nor inflating assets as michael cohen testified before congress do you think those charges are still possible? Well, as several people have said, this is the first series of indictments. There's much more to come, they think. But also, people are worried. Like, this is all they have? Um, They've been talking to Michael Cohen, his fixer and lawyer, for a long time, the prosecutors. Now they're trying to get another um, person who's been on the inside for five decades. Clearly, the, the, the feeling is that, that they want more to get this guy. I mean, he has been Houdini. He, you know, he beat impeachment twice. It's been very hard to get him. And it's, but it is really interesting that now he's not saying he didn't do this. He's just saying, hey, it's not murder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, LZ, former President Trump is still teasing a comeback, of course, or, or running again in 2024. Do you think that's something the Republican Party would welcome? It seems so, because they're still willing to follow his lead in a lot of areas. I mean, if you think about all of the bills that are being passed across the country right now in terms of you know, voter registration and voter restrictions, they are all based upon the lie that came from Trump, who's the original source of all of this. So I think there's legislative proof that, yes, they're still willing to follow his lead, despite the fact that he has these allegations around him. You don't think there's anything behind the scenes there, Republicans saying, we got to follow him now, but... Hopefully he won't run. I mean, they've been saying that for five years. we got to follow him now. They've just been following him. Okay. And on the, on the, on the January 6th committee, Avery, this week the House voted to establish a select committee to investigate the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Two Republicans, just two Republicans voted for it. And Speaker Pelosi tapped one of them, Liz Cheney, to serve on the committee. So can this kind of committee really get to the bottom of this? 
Well, listen, I think the, the folks who have been appointed to that committee are certainly going to try. And it was really important for Speaker Pelosi to, to nominate and to appoint Liz Cheney to that position, because regardless of what the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, does, uh, whether he decides he's going to put some far right or the Trump loyalists onto that committee, or he decides not to put any uh, Republicans up for that committee at all, there is going to be a bipartisan group of lawmakers trying to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th. And, and Molly, Republicans are already blasting this as partisan. How will it work for them? How does Kevin McCarthy choose people to be on the committee? Well, the ball is really in Kevin McCarthy's court, and he has repeatedly declined to say whether he's going to appoint anyone to this committee at all. The feeling on Capitol Hill is that he probably will, uh, but then uh, will those people see their role primarily as, as undermining the committee, as trying to prevent it from going to certain places, particularly as it looks to uh, for President Trump's role in the events of January 6th? because that is really uh, the sort of red hot center of all of the controversy surrounding this committee. So, you know, what it's it's less about what it will find, I think, uh, since there are, as Republicans have repeatedly said, so many other agencies and, uh, and, and law enforcement jurisdictions looking at what happened, unearthing the evidence, charging individuals. It's more about, as the 9-11 Commission did, uh, bringing all that evidence together to create a shared understanding, a shared narrative that Americans can use to understand and so, uh, you know, the Republicans uh, don't want to be part of that process. Uh, and they have succeeded, I think, in large part in preventing there from being a sort of bipartisan shared American understanding of this traumatic event. So I don't know how, how successful the committee can be going forward in that circumstance. And, and LZ, what do, you, what do you think the committee can accomplish, and particularly the racism that was evident on January 6th. I was up there, lots of white supremacists, lots of uh, Confederate flags. How do you think this will play out? You know, I think this committee serves two purposes. One, obviously, is to get to the bottom of what happened. But then the other is also send a clear message to people who are thinking or maybe on the fence in terms of where they want to pledge their allegiances. You know, where I grew up in Detroit, we had this phrase, you don't want that smoke. And basically what that means is, there might be trouble that you might talk a good game about, but when real pressure comes and real uh, accountability is being held, people who really aren't fully committed to a certain cause may begin to back down. So hopefully just the presence of this committee at least gives people who don't want that smoke, who like talking and tweeting, but won't do things that are dangerous and impact the, the, the larger society. And, and Mary, how do you think this will impact the midterms before voting down that 9-11 style independent commission several republicans said they were really worried about this dragging into 2022 i think all all this is it's all about the midterms it's crucial Kevin mccarthy could become the house speaker if they gain back uh, you know doesn't not going to take too many seats um and what they don't want what the republicans don't want is you know can imagine all the tv uh clips of uh, a police officer talking about what happened, that he couldn't get back up, that it was right from the top, um, from the president on down. So I think that the, eventually the truth will be known, but right now there's a lot of Republicans who are trying to put the brakes on it because of the midterms. And, and Avery, I want to turn to the Supreme Court and the voting rights. Ruling in this case out of Arizona, explain the case and, and what you think this will mean. Well, it was a 6-3 decision on ideological lines to uphold uh, voting restrictions in Arizona that Democrats and voting advocates called discriminatory on the basis of race. And uh, because of this decision, it's going to deal a blow to that fight against uh, what voting advocates would call uh, voter suppression uh, in, in Republican-led states across the country. And the fact is that uh, the American people are not on the side of the Republican lawmakers in some of these states. Two to one, if you look at the ABC Washington uh, Post poll, you see that uh, Americans believe that it is more important to have uh, voting uh, laws that make it easier to vote lawfully than uh, laws that make it harder to vote fraudulently. And, and particularly in Georgia, they're lo everyone's looking at Georgia right now, Molly. That's right. Although this is, you know, all over the country that these kinds of laws are, are being considered and passed. And, and 
that. And, you know, frankly, the sort of Democratic establishment is concerned that they have not effectively countered this this push. Uh, whether you're talking about in Congress, uh, where the big, you know, what they call democracy reform bill uh, went down, uh, or whether you're talking about in the states, where I think this case, more than anything, sent a clear signal about how the Supreme Court is going to look at the Democratic uh, attempts to, to litigate these laws. The lawsuits that are being brought in various states, uh, and in Georgia you have the Justice Department involved, that of course makes it a different story than, than simply a lawsuit. But even there you have to wonder about you know, how the courts are going to look at attempts to combat these laws using the legal system. And so if it's not going to happen on Capitol Hill, if it's not going to happen in the courts, then it has to happen in the political process. And it's going to be about, uh, as Avery is saying, uh, using the fact that these laws are unpopular uh, to try to motivate Democratic voters. And, and exactly, LZ, uh, as Avery pointed out, Molly pointed out, not exactly in line with public opinion. No, of course not, but they don't really care about public opinion, right? If they did, then the, all of this legislation would be looking at differently. You know, the thing that really frustrates me most is that the justices acknowledge that these new laws does impact minorities. They didn't deny that aspect of it. They just said that the inconvenience of it isn't so great. Well, they're all privileged. And I grew up poor. I remember my mom scraping together 50 cents, 75 cents a dollar just for gas money to get to the grocery store. When you do that to polling places, now you're forcing minorities to decide whether or not they're going to invest money, gas money, to get to the polling places that are now far further away, or do I use this gas money to get to the grocery store or do I get to work? They're privileged saying that this doesn't inconvenience them enough. But how do you know? When was the last time you were that poor? I, I'd like to talk about, I went down to Mississippi and I saw this. And on the morning of the election, people would turn out and the polling place would be closed in the place where there were a lot of Democratic voters. And so the question then was, okay, do I drive? Do I spend another, you know, 45 minutes in the car to go there and then wait in a really long line? There's all kinds of dirty tricks being played about closing polls, switching where you're supposed to be, telling people they're in the wrong place, even if in their, the right place. I think if people really knew what was going on, because it differs state by state and county by county, they would think, you know what, it's July 4th here. It's all about voting, right? It's the most fundamental of rights. We, we uh, had the Boston Tea Party because we couldn't vote. We were getting taxed. And it's kind of shocking that right now, a lot of people don't have the same access to votes as other Americans. But, but we certainly, Molly wouldn't be shocked by the Supreme Court decision in the direction it went. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think given that the way, the way the court is composed, and what you hear from a lot of conservatives, too, is that this decision was rather limited. It applied to a couple of specific situations, uh, to, you know, specifically votes in the wrong precinct and ballot harvesting. Uh, it wasn't about closing polling places or a lot of the other things that have been alleged. Uh, so in some quarters on the right, there's a feeling that the Democrats are sort of hyperventilating about this. Uh, but, you know, it obviously has implications for so many other cases that are being brought and so many other laws that are being lit litigated across the country. And, and, and Avery, speaking of Democrats, does this up the pressure on moderate Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema to push <coughs> harder for new voting legislation or what? Well, listen, this is definitely going to revive the conversation around eliminating the filibuster. And for those Democrats who've been wary of filibuster reform, uh, this is going to uh, be a confrontation to them. They're going to have to square their defense of a legislative body uh, with the protection of voting rights for American voters who are really at the heart of the democracy that they, they say they hold dear. Okay. We are going to have much more with all of you guys on the round table. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Get a few final thoughts on this Independence Day from our round table. And Elsie, I want to start with you. This is a day of celebrating our nation's independence. We've come so far since a little more than a year ago. A quick assessment, though, of where you see us as a nation today, a divided nation still. Uh, I think about the more than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills that have been introduced this year alone. Many of them targeting uh, transgender youth, children. So I feel as long as we have elected officials who are willing to use children as political pawns to gain points, 
who are willing to use the country's most vulnerable to gain points will always have this division. That's where we need to start addressing that. And Mary, I think that people need to remember that what's throwing gasoline on the fire for those who are angry at each other and angry at the government is income inequality. The rich are getting richer and they're more homeless. And when you have 50 of the richest people have as much wealth as 165 million Americans, people think it's unfair. And I think that restoring what America was, that it was a magnet for the ambitious, I think that would go a long way to mitigating some of the divisions. Molly. Well, you know, I think divided we stand, right? We are a very divided country and people are real mad at each other still. You see that, you can't hardly walk down the street without seeing that. But we are still standing. We have come through. We've been divided uh, before. We have been divided before. Uh, hopefully it doesn't result in an actual civil war this time, although unfortunately some people talk about that. Uh, but, but I think, you know, this is a moment to look back on the year that we've had, the year and a half that we've had and say, we can come together physically and maybe we can also come together politically. Maybe that's uh, an insane, naive, pie in the sky, optimistic thing to think. Uh, but maybe it is possible now that things seem to be getting better. I'm all for optimism today as well. And, and Avery, I just want some final thoughts from you. Um, you. You cover the Hill, you cover politics every single day of your life. You've seen this division up close. Are you optimistic? Well, look, I think the work of striving for a more perfect union, that work remains unfinished. And because of that, despite the divisions, I think that anything is possible. And, and Mary, just some uh, very quick talk, because you have traveled the world. You have lived around the world. I just did a very whirlwind trip, whirlwind trip myself. You look at the world, you look at us. What made us different was that we made everyone feel equal, whether it was vote, whether it was your um, ability to make money and move up and social mobility. And I just think that we need to go back to the basics. You know, 1776, this was it. We were going to be different than everybody else. Everybody was going to be equal. And when we do that, we'll be fine. Thanks, Mary. Thanks to all of you for being with us this 4th of July.